Welcome to the Known Victory Church YouTube channel. We are so glad that you found us today. We exist to make Jesus known and to be a place that anyone can call home. If you haven't yet, make sure to subscribe, like, and share these messages so we can truly make Jesus known in our homes, cities, and across the world. We pray that this message impacts you and helps you to grow closer to Jesus. Yeah. 2023. I think I said this last week, but we made it. I don't know about you, but sometimes it feels like we're still in 2021. I don't know if, you're, if you feel that. It's like, how, where did the time go? You know, I'm talking about we're 2023 already, but you know, we're excited again, brand new uh, year, 2023. And, and as, a, as a church, as our pastor, I was really thinking about, you know, how do we want to go into this new year? Like, what do we want to start this year doing? And really, I kept having this thought, we need to talk about prayer, and how the importance of prayer, but not just the importance, because I think a lot of us, we, you know, we know w- that prayer is important, but for some of us, we don't really know how to pr- pray that well, right? When we look at our routines and structure with prayer, it can be pretty weak. If, I can't be the only one that sometimes my prayer life feels like nothing's happening, okay? I can't be the only one. And, you know, prayer is such an important part of following Jesus, such an important part of following Jesus, because prayer, it's, it's prayer that connects us to God, right? It's, that's the connection, is when we have a conversation with Jesus. That's what connects us to him and grows our relationship. And I think for many of us, we, we pray out of religion rather than relationship. We pray because we think that's what we're supposed to do. We don't pray because we know that's what we need to do. And so for some of us, that's our prayer life is we just pray. There's no depth to it. We just pray because we feel like we have to. We feel like it's just like a part of our journey, a part of our story. We just have to pray. For some of us, that is our journey with prayer. And for some of us, we only pray when we need something from God, right? When we need something from him. I don't know if you have a friend like that. The only time they ever message you is when they need some money or something like that. It's like, hey, hey, I know we haven't talked in six years, but hey, can you come like help me finish my basement? I need, I need an electrician like badly. Can you just come do it? I'll pay for the material and I'll buy you some pizza, right? You know what I'm talking about? We have friends like that. Some of us, that's the way we are with God. The only time we talk to him is when we need something from him. How frustrating must that be, right? Because it's frustrating for me when the only time I hear from somebody is when they need something from me. And some of us, that's exactly what our prayer life is. We only go to him when we need something. You know, some of us, we don't pray at all. We've been following Jesus for years and years and years, yet our prayer life is so minimal. We don't really open our mouths to pray. The only time we do is when we feel guilty late at night before we go to bed and we can't sleep. For some of us, that's the reality of our prayer life is we don't really have structure or anything when it comes to prayer. Now, those of us, we love prayer. You know, we could pray for hours and sometimes it feels like minutes for some people. That's a beautiful place to be, but not all of us are at that space. Not all of us have dedicated time and energy and our resources into growing our relationship with Jesus through prayer. And one thing that I know for all of us As followers of Jesus, for those of us who are friends of Jesus, we have to learn to have conversations with him so we can develop our relationship. That's one thing I do know. I might not know where you are in your prayer journey because I think for a lot of us, our prayer journey is very private, which is good, but there's less accountability. So I want to encourage you, you know, this year, let's dedicate this year to prayer, especially as we start this year. And Scottish evangelist, Oswald Chambers said it like this, we have to pray with our eyes on God, not on the difficulties, right? What prayer does is it shifts our focus from what's in, from what's in front of us to what's ahead of us. It's a difference because what's in front of us, that's all we can see. But God's view is so different than ours, right? His view is, is we think so linear, right? We think forward and backward, sideways and sideways. That's, we cannot see past what's in front of us. But God, he's looking up there, he's like, this is so small compared to the next mountain you're about to go, go over, right? And we don't see from that view. And what we do when we pray is we shift our minds, we shift our eyes, we shift our focus from the difficulties, from the pain to God. We shift our focus and our trust goes from our ability to his ability. That's what prayer can do in our lives. And at our church, Jesus is our purpose, right? Jesus is what we are all about. He is why we come. He is who we worship. He is what we are about. And I believe that this year as a church, 
Again, we need to start this year in prayer to actually make Jesus our purpose. Not just something we put on a wall, but something we truly live out. I think for all of us, not just corporately, but individually, we need to do this and spend time with Jesus this year. And again, last week, as Beth shared, we started a new series called The Lord's Prayer. And we're just gonna be going verse by verse through the Lord's Prayer. We're gonna be going through the whole month of January. And last week, again, we started this, and we started with the first part, our Father, who art in hallowed, who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. And specifically, I'm, I'm gonna be using the New Living Translation uh, to go through this, the, this prayer, because it's, so, it's a little bit different the way it's worded. Um, for, for us, I think sometimes we become so, so um, it's become just like a ritual, the Lord's Prayer, something we just like recite at, you know, funerals or weddings or whatever. It hasn't actually become a part of our like prayer life. So I kind of want to use this version because it, it'll shift things a little bit so it's not just in our minds, it's something that we're actually maybe seeing. But New Living Translation, this is how it's read in the New Living, New Living Translation, Matthew 6, verse 9 to 13. It says, pray like this. Our Father in heaven, may your name be kept holy. May your kingdom come soon. May your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today the food we need and forgive us our sins as we have forgiven those who sin against us. And don't let us yield to temptation, but rescue us from the evil one. All right, this is how, when the disciples came to Jesus, this is how he said, when you pray, pray like this. So when Jesus teaches us something, we should probably listen, right? Right, when Jesus is teaching, we should probably listen to what he is saying. And again, last week we started with our Father, right? The first verse, our Father who art in heaven. But when we pray our Father, when we go to him, we might not have the right words. We might not even know exactly what we need. We might not even know exactly how we feel, but we go to him as our Holy Father. And he listens to us and he comforts us. You might not know what to say, but he knows your heart. So we go to him in humility and we go to him in transparency and honesty. But we have to start our prayer. When we pray, we start our prayer addressing our Holy Father. That is who he is. And so that's how we start our prayer. And but we're gonna, today we're gonna move on to the next part, which is Matthew 6, verse 10. And it says, may your kingdom come soon and may your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. This is one of the most dangerous parts of this, of this prayer, right? Your will be done and your kingdom come soon. That's a dangerous prayer for us to pray. And so we're gonna start this. We have two thoughts. When it comes out of this, number one is his kingdom, not mine. His kingdom, not mine. And the question is, whose kingdom are you building? Are you building his kingdom or are you building your kingdom? You know, I think a lot of us, I think naturally as humans, especially those of us who live in North America, it's all about our kingdom. It's all about my following on social media. It's all about the money that I can attain. It's all about how big I can build my business. It's how big I can build myself, not how big we can build God in our nation. And I think we see, this, uh, we see this happening in our world, in our nation, because our focus has shifted from his kingdom to ours. It's all about me, right? I think a lot of us, when we pray, we start it, you know, we even go, our Father art in heaven, holy is your name, help me build my, build my business, right? That's our prayer. Build my wallet. That's, that's our first thing. It's like, God, you're holy, yeah? Now give me what I want. <laughs> build my kingdom. We have to shift from building our kingdom to building his. Our kingdom only lasts the average of 82.75 years. His kingdom lasts forever and ever and ever. When we leave this planet, your business doesn't come with you. Your house will stay here and rot. Your car will eventually die. Your kingdom is so short his kingdom is forever. So why are we putting most of our energy and time into our kingdom and not his? Why we pray this is to really shift our minds from ourselves to him. When we go to our holy father, our father, we say, your kingdom, not mine. May your kingdom come soon. His kingdom is better. His kingdom is bigger than yours. 
Whose kingdom are you building? See, I would rather partner with him in building his kingdom rather than try and build mine alone. How much more success are you gonna see when you're building him, his name, his kingdom, rather than yours? How much more are we gonna see the fruit of that when it's, uh, when it's him, not us? Your kingdom, not mine. We have to build his kingdom. And, and we're gonna, this is, I'm gonna read Exodus verse, uh, 15, verse 18. And this comes from the end of a song that you know, Moses and the Israelites are singing the song as they cross the sea. Remember that story as they cross the sea on dry land. And this is the end of it. And this is really about the king that we serve. The Lord will reign forever and ever. This is right after they, again, they had crossed dry land. They had been delivered finally from like 300 years of slavery. 300 years of all these people knew was slavery. That's it. Their whole world was slavery. Their whole world was broken. Their whole world was pain. Their entire world was that. They didn't know freedom. They never experienced what it was like to not be a slave. Yet these are the, the words that come out of their mouth. The Lord will reign forever and ever. What that means is that he was reigning even while they were slaves in Egypt. Even while their, their ancestors are being beaten and forced to work. Even as they walked across this dry land, he was reigning. When they got across, and he was reigning. When the waves came back in and destroyed the entire army of a nation, he was reigning. And I think for a lot of us, we have to understand that yes, we go through really, really challenging times, but let this verse be our cry, that he will reign forever and ever. No matter our circumstance, he is still on the throne. The king is still on the throne. His kingdom come, not mine. That's the prayer that we pray is let's shift our focus from it's about me to it's about him. It's about him. It's about his kingdom. He will reign forever and ever. You will only reign for like, again, 82.75 years. That's average lifespan. Again, this song is one, if you read it, of triumph and hope and trust which to be honest, they hadn't really seen much of over their lifetime. And the, the song ends with, the Lord will reign forever and ever. If you were to look at our world, our world is broken and messed up, right? Like our world is so in desperate need of a king. Your kingdom come. Let's let the king of our life also be the king of our home, the king of our province, the king of our city, the king of our nation, and the king of our world. That's who we worship. The Lord is still on the throne. The king is on the throne. That's who we worship. Let his kingdom come. Let us build his kingdom on the earth, not mine. Let's, let's build his church. Let's not build you know, my church or your church, let's build his church. It's all about him. Everything we do, Jesus is our purpose. He's why we do it. We don't do it just so we can, you know, come together and laugh, have some coffee and go home. Like, it's about Jesus. That's why we come here and worship and spend time in his presence. That's the why we do this. We need to make his kingdom known here on this planet. Let us build his kingdom and not ours. Because again, we need him to be the king of our lives, the king of our family, the king of our church, the king of our business, the king of our province. We need him to be that king. Why we pray your kingdom come is that we can be the builders, the laborers to build his kingdom, not ours. I had a man come up to me just during worship that's basically what he said. You know, if, we lay, if, if God's not building it, we labor in vain. How many times are we just laboring to build our own thing and we get to the end of it, we're exhausted, burnt out, tired, and we want to quit? Weekly, some of us, you know. It's like we get to Friday, we're like, I'm done. That's it for me. I'm gonna retire. You know, I'm like, I'm 32, but I'm done. I'm retiring. Some of us, that's how we get to. It's because we're building the wrong kingdom. It's because we're building the wrong kingdom. Number two is because you're not taking any time for rest. 
So that's number one, his kingdom. Number two is his will. Now again, dangerous to pray this. I think, it, to be honest, this might be the one of the most dangerous prayers you can pray. Why? Because you give up the control of your future. <laughs> Some of us are holding on so tightly to our future, we feel like we can't let it go, and then we wonder why we're so tired. Because <laughs> we'll say, your will be done, but mine too, <laughs> you know. We like add that, you know, your will be done, but my will also, you yeah. But it's dangerous, his will, not ours. And why we pray this is so that we can give up control, we can start to rest in his presence that he will lead us through rather than us trying to lead him through, right? How many times you go through a struggle and we're trying to like pull Jesus, like, Jesus, come on, like, we gotta go. And he's like, I'm, no, this is like the wrong way, you know? His will, not ours. You know, how often do we only start praying when the battle is almost over? Right? How many times are we struggling so deeply week after week, moment after moment, trying so hard, we're burning ourselves out, we're exhausted, we have no money, we don't know what to do. We're like, God, I need you. He's like, you should have called me two months ago before the battle started. That's when we start praying. It's not when the battle's almost over. We start praying before the battle even begins. Because then you will have the strength to go through. Then you will have the strength to overcome. His will, not ours. We go to him first rather than after. Because by the time the battle's almost over, we're pretty much worn out and done. We don't know if we can keep going. Oswald Chambers, again, this is what he said. We tend to use prayer as a last resort. But God wants it to be our first line of defense. We pray when there's nothing else we can do, but God wants us to pray before we do anything at all. Most of us, that is not what we do. This is the reality, right? How many times do you get that email from work and your heart starts pounding? You're like, uh-oh, this is not good. And then you're all of a sudden, okay, what can I do, right? That's always, what can we do about this? It's like, no, that's important, but first of all, your will be done. That should be our first prayer. That should be our first prayer. Your will be done. And you know what's absolutely beautiful is that Jesus lived this out. He started praying before the battle started, and he finished praying on the cross. If you remember, and just before he goes to the crucifixion, it says this, Matthew 26, verse 39. He went a little farther and bowed his face to the ground, praying, my father, if it is possible, let this cup of suffering be taken away from me. And he says this, so powerful, yet I want your will to be done, not mine. It fascinates me that we serve a God who commands us, but also models it, right? He says, do this, and then he shows us how to do it. He says, take a day of rest. He took a day of rest. He says, he said, Jesus says, pray your will be done. And then he's in the garden in his hardest moment. And that's exactly the prayer he prays. I want your will to be done, not mine. And I want to encourage you that as parents, you can't just be the commander of your family. You have to also be a follower of your own rules. How many times as parents with young kids, it's like, I don't want you on your phone or your iPad or the TV anymore. And then we spend three hours watching the Oilers play. You see, that's not healthy for you. It always puts you in a bad mood. And then we go do the exact same thing we told them not to do. If we want to be good leaders, we have to mo- mo- like, like say this is the way it is and then actually model it. This is Jesus. He he modeled exactly what he told us to do. He says, when you pray, pray your will be done, not mine. He's in the garden, and that's the exact prayer he prays. You know how we pray this prayer? We say, your will be done, but this is how I want you to do it. (laughs) Jesus says, no, this is what I want, 
The cross is gonna suck. It's gonna be painful. It's gonna be embarrassing. Yet, your will be done. There's a difference. We can pray, God, this is what I want. There's nothing wrong with that. Do it. Pray, God, this is what I want. This is what I need. Yet, your will be done. Your will be done, not mine. Do you trust God with your future to pray that prayer? Again, Jesus prayed, take this suffering from me. The cup of suffering, right? And he says, yet, and, and it can be translated also to nevertheless, your will. Your will be done. You know, as humanity, I think we always want to know why. You know what I'm talking about? Especially, like, I think you see this in kids so clearly. It's like, I want you to brush your teeth, but why? It's like, there's a, I'm not like a dentist, but there's a lot of reasons, you know? And I'll be completely honest, like, I don't fully understand it, and I don't know if you will either. One time my brother, he's like a young kid, he's like, how can such small eyes see such big things? My mom's like, what a question. Who thinks of that? I'm like, I don't know. Like, I'm not, a, I'm not a doctor. I didn't design the eye. I don't know how it works. And even if I did, you're not gonna get it. You're three. But we wanna know why. Right, God's like, this is how it's gonna work. We're like, but why? I don't like that way. That way seems treacherous. Remember, they're going into the promised land. Ten spies come back. They say, they're too big. We can't do it. Sometimes the things in front of you seem so hard. And we want to ask God. The biggest question you see people asking is, you know, why would such a good God allow so much pain and suffering in the world? That's a bit, one of the biggest questions people ask about Jesus. Why? We want to know why. We always want to know why. Why does this work? And how does it work this way? And why this? And why that? You know, whenever you might start a new job, you don't want to just go through the motions. You probably want to know why these policies are in place or why these things happen. You ask these questions. We want to know why. But it's so interesting that God often gives us the how and sometimes he doesn't give you the why. He's like, this is how it's going to work. And we're like, but why? He's like, be patient. Rest in my presence. Stop stressing about the why and just do the how. You, you might not know why I'm making this happen. Again, we think so linear, we don't understand the fullness of what's happening. We say, your will be done because it's easier to put my trust in his hands than try and put my trust in my own hands. Your will be done. You know, oftentimes, if we don't understand why something is happening or why we're going through something, we do whatever we can to not go through with it, <laughs> right? We're like, okay, God, you're silent. He's like, I'm not. I'm telling you, but you don't like what I'm saying. It's like kids, guys, you know, Jane's just going through this phase where she's just like, I don't know what's happening, okay? I don't, I don't get it. She's becoming like, How do I say this so kindly? She's gonna watch this in like 20 years, be like, Dad, you were mean to me. She's, she's learning and growing in patience and kindness. She's, be, she's being tested. And in turn, I'm being tested too. But she, <laughs> just like, so she was like, I want candy. We're like, no. She's like, okay, I'm gonna go get it myself. Or I'm going to go ask somebody else for it, right? Because she doesn't like the answer we're giving her. No. How many times do you have to say no to your kid? Too much, right? Sometimes we don't like the answer God's giving us, so we do whatever we can to try and get it on our own. Same thing. We'll just ignore the command. We'll ignore it. We'll say, no, nah, that seems... It's not, it's not gonna work for me. Like, if people saw me do that, it'd be like weird. I don't, want, I don't want that, so no, I'm gonna do it on my own. I'm doing my own way, and we ignore it. We go the long way around. You might eventually make it back, you know? But you spend way too much money and way too much energy to try and find a better solution when the better solution was in front of you. 
We have to understand something. The writer of Revelation shared this in his book. This is Jesus. He says this. I am the Alpha and the Omega. The first and the last. The beginning and the end. I am the Alpha and Omega. The first and the last. The beginning and the end. You know how you make Jesus the king of your life? You let his kingdom come, his will be done. Realize that you're not the Alpha and Omega. You're not the first and the last. You're not the beginning and the end. You're 82.75 years right in the middle. That's it. In the grand scheme of it all, Jesus is the Alpha and the Omega. He is the first and the last. He is the beginning and the end. He knows before we know. He knows before we even start. When we pray your kingdom, your kingdom come, your will be done, we are saying, God, I might not know why, but I trust you. I trust you with my future. I trust you with my past. I trust that you're going to carry me through. I trust that you're going to take care of me. I trust that you're going to provide for me. I trust that you're going to heal me. I trust you. And my brother, he, he went bungee jumping once at West Edmonton Mall, at the water park. I don't know if they do it anymore. His friend goes before him. And he literally just ties the thing. I don't know how it works. I've never been bungee jumping. I don't know if I ever will. But he ties it to his ankles. And literally, his friend just falls like face first down. Like right now, my, you know that like tingling fear? I have that right now, I'm being honest. And I'm like on like a foot of stage, right? So Scott, my brother, I love you. But this is the story. He goes up there and they tie it to him. <laughs> and... There's a difference between thinking you can do something and actually doing something, right? The big difference. So he gets to the top and he's like, ah, this is gonna be awesome. But I'm sure every step he took up, he's like, I might die today, right? This might be the end. I don't even have a will yet, you know? He's climbing up the stairs and he looks over, he sees his friend, boom, and he looks over, he's like, no, no chance. I can't do this. I'll give you the money, but I'm not doing this, right? And there's a video of it. I haven't seen it in years. I just remembered this this morning. There's a video of it, and <laughs> I've never seen so much panic on a human's face in my life. Because they tell him, like, you hold on to whatever, like, the metal or whatever, and you just kind of, like, let go. But he's, like, shaking. And then, I don't know, I don't remember the fullness of it, but basically somehow he let go or they pushed him. I don't remember what happened. But then you see, like, the guy working just laughing. Because as he's f falling, he's, like, flailing in the air, right? Like, he's just flailing. And there's a big difference between trusting something and trusting something and not think you're going to be okay. You know, with God, like, like we trust him. It might be scary. It's like, we're like, okay, I'm going to go. I'm going to take the step. I'm going to go forward. I'm going to go forward. I'm going to keep going. Even though I don't know what's ahead of me, it seems dark. I know that you're the light of the world and your light will guide my path. I trust you with my future. So I'm going to let go and I'm going to go forward. We have to do this. Your will be done, says God, I trust you, even though I might not even know why this is happening. I trust you with my future. I trust you with my present. I trust you with my past. So I'm gonna let go and let you carry me all the way through. Do you trust God with your future? Are you at a place in your life where you can pray? Your will be done in my life. Is that a prayer that you can even pray right now? Or you say your will, not mine. We have the desires of our own heart. We know Psalm 37, 4 says, delight yourself in the Lord and he will give you the desires of your heart. But I think when we delight ourselves in him, our heart becomes his heart. And so he says, yo, delight yourself in me, trust me, find your joy in me, and then I'll give you what you need. Could you pray that prayer? Your kingdom come, 
your will be done right now. Is that a prayer that you could even pray? And when we pray this, your, may your kingdom come soon. May your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. We're giving up authority and giving up control of the future. We are saying, I might not understand these things. I might not get it. I might not understand it. But I'm going to trust you to lead me through it. You know, starting our prayers by saying, Our Father, that's who we're addressing our prayer to. And may his name be kept holy. Your kingdom, not mine. Your will, not mine. Do you trust God with your future enough to let go? Do you trust him with what you're going through right now? You might not know why, and I can't tell you why. I, might, I can't tell you what you're going to learn from this. Again, I don't think God is causing these things, but he'll help us overcome them. You might not understand why, but God will give you what you need when you need it. I truly believe that. And I guarantee you that as you come out on the other side, you will be stronger. Your character will be sharpened. One of the biggest things that hardships and stuff, difficulties lead us to is to grow our character. Do you ever go through something really prideful and come out very humble? All the time. And these things have the ability to do this. Your character will grow. Your faith will rise because you've seen him continue to lead you, continue to provide for you. Your faith will grow as you pray, your will be done. I think a lot of us, we have a higher faith in our own ability than God's ability. Let's put our faith in Jesus, not in ourselves. And our takeaway today is this. His kingdom is better than my kingdom and his will is greater than my will. His kingdom is better and his will is greater. When his kingdom becomes more important than our kingdom and his will becomes our priority over our own will, your faith, your courage, and your strength will transform you. Your trust in him for your future will not be stagnant and it will not be broken. That's why we pray your kingdom come, your will be done.